Hello OSA, Taras here. Welcome to another episode of our running series, What is a Fish? And today, we are covering an absolute doozy. Behind me, you'll see what is arguably one of the most mystical and classic reef organisms that we have on the planet. This is a ribbon eel, specifically a ribbon moray eel. So today's family is the Moranidae. So contrary to most belief, all the eels are not grouped into one family. There's something like the American eels, the Anguillidae, and then these guys on the Moranidae. These are the moray eels. And, and that comes from the ancient Greek term for the eels that the ancient Romans and and Greeks would catch out of the Red Sea, their native moray eel. So this family is pretty easy to distinguish from the rest of the eels because their mouths are always agape. They're always constantly pumping water through their buccal chamber and that's how they're, uh, they're aspiring. And basically what these guys are doing all day is they are chilling out in their little pads out in the reef and their rock crevices. They're hanging out in between corals and seaweeds. Their mouths agape and they're just opportunistic predators. They're waiting for feed items to come by and all of a sudden this beautiful majestic creature all of a sudden turns into a, a springboard full of razor sharp teeth captures the prey item retreats in chills out with his eel buddies and uh, uh, finishes his meal so let's talk about eel biology real quick eels anyone who's used them especially a striper bait around here or anyone who's tried to transfer an eel from an aquarium knows that they're very difficult to get your hands on they literally slip through your fingers no matter what you do even if you have a cloth uh, around your hands are still very difficult to keep a hold of and that's because eels have lots of goblet cells and highly specialized goblet cells and what goblet cells are are specialized cells that fish have on their skin that produce mucus Every fish has them, and that's what makes the slime coat. The eels have basically the, the super-powered panzer tanks of, of goblet cells, and that's why their slime coat is one of the most powerful, thick, has all these properties that science is still trying to figure out. Let's talk about the early life history of the eels and why, uh, for the most part, they have a lot of inherent challenges. Now, there are some species of moray eels, such as the snowflake and the zebra moray eel, that can survive years if not decades in captivity in aquaria. We've been able to work it out. They're very intelligent. As long as you can get a lot of food in them and you have a stabilized tank, you can have a lot of success with these. Despite the success that we've had with the snowflake eel and zebra mora eel, many more eel species can be extremely difficult to keep and are not recommended for beginners. Uh, there's two reasons for that. One, the diets can be complex. Uh, you can get a uh, eel to eat, but it might not be necessarily the specialized reef fish diet that it needs. Uh, two, they're escape artists. Because of that slime and because of that long snake-like shape, they can get through any minor opening in the tank. So unless you have a very tightly fitting lid, you're always running the risk of losing your eels. They also, of course, will sometimes take to plumbing if you don't take some appropriate measures. Despite the fact that we've had success with some species and that people have had some broodstock moray eels for years and years, they're almost impossible to breed. And that's because eels, morays, regular eels, and, and other uh, members of the leptocephalans have this larval state, which we can't really begin to describe. Just like a, a caterpillar is so different than a butterfly, the larval state of these guys is essentially a living piece of glass thread. And it exists for months, and in some species, years at a time and has a completely different life cycle that's completely estranged from the adult critter. And we don't even really know what it does in the wild, let alone uh, do we have the capacity to get these eels to breed and be able to satiate that larval state in captivity. So for that reason, moray eels are highly unlikely to be aquacultured in the foreseeable future without tremendous revelations uh, in their biology. That's not to say that it won't ever happen because they are some of the most jaw-dropping centerpieces that you can have in the reef really should only be attempted by people who are seasoned reef keepers and people that are willing to have specialized gear such as tightly fitting lids and people that are willing to really be on top of getting their eels to eat continuously and religiously. One other thing to note, very few if no exceptions, this family of moray eels is extremely toxic to human consumption. Just like the puffer fish and the trigger fish, they can have extremely high levels of ciguaratoxin, uh, basically an algae-based neurotoxin that builds up in the tissues of these organisms and makes them inedible to humans. In fact, entire villages out in the South Pacific have succumbed to widespread food poisoning after eating just one half of a cooked 
moiré eel. What is very interesting and why we should care is that scientists think that it's uh, organisms that have the Sagara toxin that the eel seeks out to consume and that potentially plays a nutritional role in uh, the eel's natural diet. Any uh, other fish families that you'd like us to cover, please comment below, ring the bell, feed the hungry algorithm, and we'll, we'll see you next time.